dive into God's Word, dig a little deeper, discover the Bible's message for you today. Hello, thank you for joining me today as we continue our study of Genesis as the foundation of uh, our understanding of Scripture. Our lesson titled today is Creation and Marriage. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, uh, we again praise you today that you uh, are creator, that you chose to create this world, that you chose to create humanity, and that you chose to create each one of us. We know that as a loving creator, you also sustain life, and we thank you that you didn't just turn away and let things um, run on their own. Uh, you are still closely involved. You are watching over each one of our lives as our creator and as our sustainer. We thank you for this. We praise you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At the end of creation week, and this is Genesis 1 verse 31, God looks at all that he has done and he pronounces it very good. Now, earlier in um, the account in Genesis chapter 1, we read several times that you know things were good. Um, but at the end of creation week, in Genesis 1.31, uh, we read, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. You can just imagine uh, God's satisfaction, his pleasure, as he looks at this new world that has come into existence uh, in a matter of days. And uh, he says, it is very good. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse number 4, there's an even stronger word used to describe God's work. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. And certainly God's work at creation was perfect. There was no flaw. There was no error. Um, God did not have to use uh, a process of evolution, which in, includes death and suffering. He didn't have to use that. Uh, and He didn't use that. Uh, he brings forth life through the power of His Word. When it comes to Adam and Eve, He kneels down in the dust. He rolls up His sleeves, so to speak. He gets His hands dirty. Um, but everything that He does is perfect. And by the way, I love that verse in Deut Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, because it assures us that not only was God's work at creation perfect, as He created the world in a, in a physical sense, but his work in dealing with sin is also perfect. And that can be hard for us uh, to believe sometimes. It can be hard for us to understand as we go through trials, as um, loved ones may be taken from us, as we deal with sickness or loss of jobs, whatever it may be. Um, this life, you know, this world is a tough place to live. And it can often be difficult for us to believe that God is actually uh, either in control or that He is doing things the right way. Uh, and we are often tempted to second-guess God. You know, does He really care? Uh, why did He allow this to happen? Why? How many times has that, that question been asked, why God? Why did this happen? Why me? Why now? All of those answers aren't revealed to us. But the Bible says God's work is perfect. The Bible says that the way God is dealing with sin is also perfect. And, uh, you know, we'll have the opportunity on the other side of um, the second coming to get a better picture of why God has dealt with it this way. Uh, probably we'll never completely understand because God is God and, and we are not. But nonetheless, the Bible says God's work is perfect. And I uh, just one more thought on this before we, we uh, move forward with uh, the lesson here on, on marriage. Nahum 1 verse 9 says that sin will never rise up a second time. Affliction will never come again. And because God is dealing with sin in the way He is, even though we don't always understand it, it doesn't always make sense. And we often think, man, if I was in control, if I had the power God has, I would have dealt with this different. Even though we deal with those questions, we can rest assured based on the promises of God's Word that God is dealing with sin in a perfect way because His work is perfect. And someday, I believe that's someday soon, when we have a chance to look back and see uh, how God has, has 
done this from behind the scenes, so to speak, uh, we, will, we will agree, Lord God, you, you were dealing with things perfectly. There is no better way that you could have dealt with this horrible thing called sin. Okay, coming back to uh, marriage, creation and marriage. Uh, God declares his work to be very good at the end of the sixth day. And um, we're going to look at one of the reasons why God declared that work to be very good, and that is because uh, he had just performed the first wedding ceremony. And we'll get there in just a minute. Let's back up again. In Genesis 1, verse 27, uh, we read this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Uh, very fascinating verse here in Genesis 1.27 that humanity is created in God's image, but man alone or woman alone does not uh, reflect in the fullest way possible that image of God. It's when you have man and woman together that the image of God uh, is really realized in the fullest way that it can be within humanity. That's important. Um, it brings out the importance of marriage and this, this marriage relationship between a man and a woman as part of God's original plan for this world. And it's part of what he pronounces very good. It's part of what makes God's perfect work at creation. Now, marriage, of course, uh, is under heavy attack in the world today. Uh, the idea, the concept of marriage, certainly the biblical concept of marriage being between a man and a woman, one man, one, one woman for life, uh, that's almost completely uh, lost sight of today or ignored and attacked today. Nonetheless, the Bible says that it's male and female together united in marriage where we finally, or where we see the image of God. One verse before that, Genesis 1 verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Here we have, uh, again, God says, let us. There's reference to the plural here. And so uh, part of the the image or the likeness of God, part of what it means to be uh, reflecting the image of God is to have a plurality. And again, man and woman together in marriage uh, makes up that plurality. Let's uh, look now at Genesis uh, chapter 2. Well, let me say this as well. Um, looking again at Genesis 1 verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. You know, what is God like? Well, there's, there's many ways, uh, many things the Bible tells us about God. Uh, 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. And as a result of that love, uh, humanity came into existence. And we see that as uh, well being reflected within the marriage um, institution. Love between a man and a woman can uh, lead to new life. And so we see another aspect of the reflection of God's likeness or His image here in marriage. If we move to Genesis chapter 2, we get uh, a lot more uh, detail and explanation about um, uh, marriage. Of course, that first marriage ceremony is performed by God at the end of the sixth day uh, after God creates Eve um, out of Adam's rib. We read in Genesis 2 verse 23, Adam says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. A lot of you know, important concepts here regarding marriage. Um, first of all, there's the, the, the union between man and woman where they become one. And, and this, of course, is why... The, the dissolution of marriage and divorce can be such uh, a painful and destructive thing is because they, the two have, have truly become one in a spiritual sense. Um, and that's something God never intended to be undone. Verse 24 again says that a man should leave his father and his mother and then cleave unto his wife. You know, to cleave is, is a strong union. It's a bond. Uh, it's something 
that uh, you're not letting go. There's, there's commitment here. And uh, this is part of God's intention for marriage as well. And again, at the end of verse 24, they shall be one flesh. It's very interesting uh, when we look in Ephesians chapter 5 that the same, uh, well, the entire concept of marriage is taken as, uh, and used as a symbol of the relationship that Christ wants with his church. Ephesians 5 verse 25 uh, says this halfway through, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. An incredible promise here, friends, about what Christ promises to do in and for his people before the second coming. When he comes back, the Bible says that Jesus will have a church that has been sanctified and cleansed through His power, through His Word. And again, verse 27 says that He will have a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but one that is holy and without blemish. Uh, incredible promise, friends, uh, but it's based on God's Word. We can have faith that He is going to, to work this miracle in and through His people. A few verses later in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Paul really brings out this marriage analogy again. He says, We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. This is uh, that spiritual mystical, if we can use that word, uh, union that Christ wants with his church as a whole. He also wants it with each one of us individually. Uh, and the best part is he promises that we can have that as we ask him to make this a reality in our lives. There's a very fascinating statement found in the book, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 63. And it has to do with the origin of marriage and its connection with the Sabbath. Uh, perhaps you've heard this statement before. Then, speaking of Eden, then marriage and the Sabbath had their origin, twin institutions for the glory of God and the benefit of humanity. Then, as the Creator joined the hands of the holy pair in wedlock, saying, A man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one. He enunciated the law of marriage, for all the children of Adam to the close of time. That which the Eternal Father Himself had pronounced good was the law of highest blessing and development for man. Now, I only have a minute and a half left and um, really don't have time to dig into this statement like, like I wish we did. But very briefly, uh, marriage and the Sabbath are twin institutions. Twins are things that are born at the same time, right? Creatures, not things. Creatures, people that are born at the same time. And if the Sabbath and marriage are twin institutions, then they uh, had their start, their beginning at the same time. And we see it right here in, in uh, the creation account. At the end of the sixth day, the Sabbath was born, if we can use that word, as the seventh day begins. Um, and according to the narrative here in Genesis 2, Adam and Eve were married uh, late on the sixth day. I like to think of it right at sunset. As the Sabbath is beginning, God pronounces them husband and wife. And so, twin institutions, they are also being attacked here at the end of time. Uh, marriage has been under heavy attack. It is, it will continue to be. And uh, at some point in the near future, the Sabbath is going to come under special attack as well. It shouldn't surprise us. They're twin institutions. Both of them are meant to be blessings um, for humanity. Both of them are blessings for us when we observe them and participate in them as God uh, intends. Well, friends, we're out of time once again. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that you've been blessed by the time spent in God's Word, and please join me again tomorrow.